Hi, my name is Nicole Kang Ferriolo, and this conversation is being recorded in December 2022. And I currently work as Director of Global Strategic Initiatives at the Council on Library and Information Resources, or CLEAR. So the first thing I will say is that openness is not right for every collection and every community. I think this is an important disclaimer. There are so many communities who have had their records stolen and in some cases weaponized against them. Communities who would prefer to prioritize privacy or to have a closed system that is only accessible to their members should absolutely have every right to do so. In particular, I'm thinking of indigenous communities and other communities that have been exploited in the name of cultural heritage over the years. That said, open access and open glam is right for many collections and cultural heritage organizations. And there are major advantages both to the institutions themselves and to the public good in doing so. So I'd like to talk about four advantages here. So the first is that when done right, the greatest advantage for open cultural heritage is digital equity. Removing paywalls means that more people can afford to access these materials. We live in a wildly inequitable world and access to our culture should not contribute to this. Removing permission requirements makes things more accessible. Uh, for instance, if you're on a deadline, you may not have 24 to 48 hours to sit around and wait for an archivist to approve your access request. Openness further increases equity by diminishing gatekeeping. It improves accessibility, and it enables people to access files from the safety of their own homes without risk of harassment or exposure to illness. The second point I want to make is that it changes the ways that we tell stories. Opening up collections in the glands makes it possible for people to use collections in ways that we might have never imagined. If you think of museum exhibitions, they can be expensive and difficult to change. Um, and often it's the same small pool of professional curators that are able to tell these stories. By opening up collections, it lets anyone become a curator, which can lead to new methodologies in research and new forms of expression. We're already seeing glam files used in AI, XR spaces, data analysis, but we're also seeing them make their way into independent film, songwriting, video games, and even tattoos. Uh, the third thing I wanna mention is that it helps to provide evidence against disinformation by making it easy for anyone to access GLAM materials and archival materials. Uh, more people have the ability to fact check and conduct primary source research when they hear a claim. And the fourth thing that I wanna mention is that by inviting people in, it also makes people excited about history and historical preservation. It strengthens our connection to the past, our ancestors, and to the people and places that came before us. And it makes the case for why preserving our heritage matters. So there's a number of barriers that I'd like to talk about today. Uh, the first is corporate interests. There's a lot of pressure and short-term incentives to enter into a closed for-profit system. Companies are willing to pay for the digitization and digital preservation of your collections uh, and to do the work for you. So for many institutions, particularly ones that are pressed on budget matters, this seems like a win-win. But what is lost is that the collections only become available to those who can afford to pay for them, which is generally limited to wealthy R1 universities. It also means that the preservation and maintenance of these collections falls to the private company and if the company goes under, or if your collections become more expensive to maintain than the funds that they contribute, they can easily be tossed aside or lost. Um, there are real sustainability risks with going this route. The second barrier that I'd like to mention are gatekeepers, um, or the feelings of ownership by archives and archivists. So most archives and collecting organizations see themselves as a the public good. They preserve and make available our records, but many also see the materials as being theirs and thus only share them with the people they choose to let in. Uh, this is especially true for the archives where the archivists themselves are scholars of the materials they work with and don't want their research to get scooped by other scholars. So hand in hand with this is the often false assumption, which I'll get into a little later, um, that having tight control over the documents is important for financing the institution, uh, be it through access fees or photocopy fees, um, and the third barrier that I'd like to mention um, are the difficult ethical questions. 
So I mentioned at the top that openness isn't right for all organizations and collections. And this is especially true for organizations that hold the collections of other communities that are not represented by the organization itself. So I think before launching into an openness initiative, you should think about the collections and ask yourself, A, are they yours to share? But also B, are they yours to protect? Sharing material has the potential to both help and harm communities. Similarly, not sharing material also has the potential to both help and harm communities. It's obviously harmful to expose sensitive or private materials, but it's also harmful to keep records closed and to place access burdens on descendants. And it's harmful for communities to have their stories hidden while others are made available, thus making their stories less prominent in the historical record, leading to reductionist representations and narratives. In general, it's a bad idea to make assumptions about what descendants and communities want. And neither action nor inaction is a neutral act. If you have collections where you don't feel like your organization reflects the community, it may be time to get in touch with community members about their preservation and access wishes. And in some cases, it may be worth looking into repatriation, either physical or digital. And if you aren't comfortable making decisions about openness for these collections, it may be, this, may be a sign of a bigger problem. It's worth asking yourself if you are really the right steward for these collections at all, and if perhaps they should be returned to their original communities. So a couple years ago, I hosted a season of Clear's Material Memory podcast focused on cultural memory and the climate crisis. And one of my concerns in that season was, given the scale of damage during the climate crisis, should we even be thinking about cultural heritage at all when actual lives are at stake? And one of the things we found is that when you start talking to people about their climate concerns, so many of the people, particularly in BIPOC and marginalized communities, are most concerned with losing their identities, their culture, their heritage, and their traditions. This was something that Victoria Herman, president of the Arctic Institute, found when she interviewed 350 local leaders and tribal elders in Alaska. It's what Blessing Onima, an anthropologist and museum expert in Nigeria, said about climate threats in Nigeria. And it's what Saiful Alam Chaudhry, a media studies professor and journalist, said about environmental displacement in Bangladesh. There is such an urgent need to preserve our cultures right now. And because of climate displacement, so many people will need to access materials from outside of their traditional home locations. We cannot risk losing culture or for it to be privatized and not accessible to communities and descendants. Open culture feels more important than ever right now. Ninety-nine percent of the time, GLAM organizations will be better off financially by practicing openness than by not. Clear did a study several years ago looking at art museums and found that the museums studied uh, that of them, none that enforced copyright, copyright made money once the expenses of enforcing it were taken into consideration, and that in all cases, the losses of enforcing copyright were higher than perceived. Meanwhile, an approach to openness helps to make the case for the public good of your institution. Whether it's to your university, your local or national government, your patrons or funders, it opens up new funding opportunities in doing so. It's also just the right thing to do. Done thoughtfully and in the right circumstances, openness, openness increases equity and has the potential to make the historical record culturally richer and a more inclusive place. <laughs>